Well, thank you, Joe and Richard, very much for joining me for this In Conversation With. I really appreciate your time. And what I'm going to do is give you both a little bit of an introduction so that people watching can know a little bit more about your background and where you've come from. So Joe is a former head of drama and English teacher in schools. And Joe moved into higher education to work with the late Sir Ken Robinson, developing arts and creative teacher education programmes for specialists and non-specialists at primary and secondary level in teacher education and researching artists in education for almost 10 years. From 2002 to 2011, she, worked, she led one of the region's creative partnership programmes working across education, community and cultural sectors to enable over 160 schools to develop bespoke creative learning innovations at the heart of their school improvement through partnership working. Since 2013, her research interests focus upon the impact of creative and cultural value of an arts and engineering project titled The Imaginarium, where she has developed new approaches to measuring creativity in relation to STEAM, as well as a concept of art making as the site for developing broad educational aims. Wow, that's a huge amount of experience. <laughs> and Richard was a youth worker and teacher before returning to higher education. Over the last 25 years, he's been involved in a number of projects and programmes. He is the higher education research and development lead in the Centre for Collaborative Learning at the University of Central Lancashire. His research is primarily in philosophical approaches to educational policy and practice. At the moment, he's working on the development of hybridised curricula, especially drawing together STEM and the arts. He also dabbles in elective home education, informal education and higher education practice. Again, it's great to have you both here, especially with all that experience that you have. And obviously, our conversation today is going to be centred on STEAM education, which from reading your bios, You've both been working in this domain for quite a long time now. So I'm, I'm going to be really intrigued to, you know, explore STEAM education with you in this conversation. Now, you have written an article uh, that I really loved the title of, and it was titled The Value of Instability, Lessons from Reviewing How and Why Creativity and the Arts Might Interact with STEM Education. Now, what really interested me about that title was this notion of instability and STEAM education and I'm just wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about those notions. Okay well I, um, I'll start us off I mean the, the notion of um, uh, suggesting instability was obviously in some ways provocative in the sense that we like to think of education as being something that's stable and solid and we know exactly what it is and, and it was pre precisely those reasons that we wanted to provoke um, in order to be able to kind of ask questions about what kind of education and what for, because one of the things that was at the heart of the discussions we had whilst we were working on the, the Beer Esteem Commission was around recognising this diversity of, of, of purposes that people were bringing to the table and um, making assumptions often that we all understood what we meant by STEAM education. So this notion of purpose and the purpose of education, I guess, was at the heart of that. Yeah. So, we, I mean, I think we we were trying to argue against uh, a move we see in curriculum in teaching, which is around you have a learning objective and you teach towards it. And one of the things that I think was coming out of Joe's research and, and um, came out of the, the Beer Review was uh, the need to think much more about uh, the rich what rich education experiences can provide if you're clear about what the purpose of those things is that actually you can map and I guess one of the things that we're we're thinking about a little bit more now is the difference between teaching to a learning objective and mapping against a learning objective as a result of a rich educational experience and one of the things we saw in the Imaginarium data was the sense of richness in terms of it, 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 um, bringing students into a, a, and pupils into a situation in which they, they were learning. And actually, because of the design of, of the education experience and because of its clarity of purpose, uh, we could trust uh, the process to be able to deliver on the kinds of learning outcomes that we wanted, but in abundance more. So you were able to get this broad and balanced as well as get uh, learning, key learning outcomes achieved. And I think it was that difference between 
focusing on a learning outcome and achieving it by a direct pedagogy. So we need to know what two plus two is, and we kind of direct it towards learning two and two, as opposed to embedded, the fact that pupils are engaged in this rich educational experience and learn uh, how to do maths, how to do English, about themselves, about communication, all those kind of things, uh, but that they're still learning about the kind of science and arts outcomes that simply happen as part of that richness. Uh, and it was the imaginary, I mean, because I'm a philosopher, I kind of piggyback on Joe's um, uh, empirical research on the Imaginarium. So it was, but it was that kind of sense of, of, of the, what the Imaginarium could achieve and then saying, well, how do we pull apart that a little bit in terms of broader kind of curriculum questions? And I suppose it's that representation that you'll, you'll be familiar with, uh, Victoria, in, in relation to creativity in the sense that, you know, work work can be both disciplined, uh, purposeful, um, but also be open and receptive to other opportunities, you know, that, that, you know, that we can, to use Austin's words, expect the unexpected in the journey. But that doesn't necessarily diminish the purpose of what we're doing, uh, that actually what it does is it enriches and we can design learning to ensure that those rich kind of learning possibilities emerge. And I think one of the difficulties we had when we were working in that, that broader STEAM agenda, when we were looking at the commission, was this sense that actually in relation to purposes, and this is, I guess this in some ways is, you know, the bigger question that you're interested in really around, around STEAM education, is the sense that uh, a, a lot of the time, those are that are coming to the STEAM table or, you know, want to join the party, come with a, a clear sense of their own purposes. Uh, and one of the challenges in terms of under, as understanding STEAM education is that actually that broader, uh, that understanding of the broader educative purpose is not necessarily commonly shared. Mm -hmm. Those different agendas are at play. Yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we had a, because I think it, it was when we were, because we, we, were, we were reminiscing earlier on about, because we, we wrote some of the, the, the review, the beer review documents, and certainly we, we sketched out some of these kind of more philosophical issues on a 31-hour a flight back from New Zealand, where we both, we've been presenting at, at one of the invited symposia at Nazare, and uh, we had this 31-hour flight and nothing to do, basically. Um, so we, we spent a fair chunk of that writing and sketching out some of these ideas to kind of cope with the boredom. Talk uh, about and, creative time and space <laughs> to, to think a problem through. That's, that's it. You just need to put everybody on plane. Yeah, we, did, we, we did have to rewrite some bit because we were kind of writing like four in the morning. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things that came out of that, I think, was, was trying to categorise, trying to do some of that kind of Foucauldian kind of uh, uh, archaeological kind of setting out of the, of, the, of, the, of the order and what was the best way to order a lot of these STEAM projects. And we found some, a lot with, were, if it's like, trying to respond to a deficit. So we had scientists arguing, well, we, we, want, we wanted a more value-based science education, the, the post-humanist, post-normal kind of uh, agendas. We found arts uh, organisations trying to argue for the fact that arts could be embedded in, st in STEM uh, much more clearly. We found uh, groups that wanted a more creative approach to education more generally and we, we found those that were interested in uh, the ways in which uh, we could perhaps think more, more carefully about uh, technology uh, and engineering and of course we had at the basis of, of the kind of STEM uh, political agenda the idea that somehow the, the, the countries and particularly you know the US, UK, Western European countries were kind of in a deficit against um, other nations accelerated um, teaching in, in technology and engineering. And so um, all of these things came with a deficit of our education. What I guess we, we're trying to do, we, we, you know, we've been trying to do with the, the, the recent project with teachers, with the uh, year four or five teachers, um, is that actually there's a potential in this mix of science and the arts STEM um, to be able to uh, open up a broad and balanced curricula in which actually we get back to some of the fundamentals about uh, education, about you know, uh, inducting pupils into certain kinds of knowledge uh, and giving them rich education experiences, enabling them to come to as great terms with themselves, to be able to develop the values uh, that we need. And all of that can be embedded in particular kind of education experiences. But we can only do that if we actually start to free up the idea that pupils are given to learning. Um, they're not just given to learning what we want precisely to write down on a blackboard and tell them, a whiteboard and tell them. Um, and and that, so that kind of notion of, of instability is to, uh, is to give, you know, saying the project, the Teach Make project you and I are working on at the moment, is in part working with teachers to give them the confidence to be able to say, actually, 
I can set up rich education experiences and then I can map those back. That's almost, you know, there's no problem with that because of course they're going to learn. And if I'm careful in my, my planning and I've done the, the job of setting up the education experience well, um, uh, I know they're going to learn things in these kind of areas. What I don't know is how that's going to fully come about in what kind of order and in what kind of ways, because the education experience, the actual activity directs and uh, pupils and in, in, enables pupils to learn in this uh, multifaceted way um, that isn't just about science, it isn't just about engineering, it isn't just about maths, it isn't just about English or anything else, you know, uh, drama, uh, dance, whatever it is, um, that actually all of these things combine around the idea that a pupil is learning and learning in complex ways in order to engage in a complex universe. Um, and actually, um, that enables the science. I mean, you know, Joe will say, can say more about the outcomes of the Imaginarium, but certainly, you know, uh, when we look at the outcomes of those kind of rich projects, um, the outcomes for pupils are really very strong. And so it's not a case of you do fun, arty, sciencey stuff over here, um, and then you get down to the real learning over here, but mm -hmm. actually, this is giving you real learning. Um, and the difficulty we have in, 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 the, in the curriculum as it's been for the last 20 or 30 years is it hasn't opened up to the possibilities of what we want in order to achieve what we want to achieve. Nobody, I mean, nobody's saying we can't achieve, we don't want to achieve the things that clearly are what we want in terms of a broad and balanced curriculum. But actually the curriculum, we, the approach we've taken has actually worked against our purposes rather than for it. And I think, yeah. What would you, what would you say are the rich outcomes that that are kind of that come out of a project such as the Imaginarium for the young people uh, you know what are the links of the outcomes to say Joe creativity you know how do they align with one another I, I mean I, I, there's I mean I, I think I just wanted things just be, just before to finish uh, finish on comment the Richard's making he's been talking in relation to the the, the kind of the, the way in which the Imaginarium sites and was kind of it was situated with through the Beera report but a lot of the focus that we discovered through the work that's done there has, has been on pedagogy mm -hmm. and I think our interest really was our was upon attention to curriculum and the way in which therefore it needed to be conceived differently and I think with the what the Imaginarium as a project um demonstrated i mean it was in its first in my in the first experimental kind of uh, model of it it was very much the project to see whether any of the hypotheses um uh, might emerge and in some ways it was it was unusually modeled on a partnership between a cultural organization and schools so it was not conceived as something it was conceived in order to respect the extant curriculum but it was also conceived on the on the basis of um, the arts and the engineering, uh, the practices of these fields being both complementary and enriching to each other. And that that fostered a kind of uh, a culture and a way of thinking and a way of behaving that was different. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that came out of the Imagineerium that's been key to its practice is this notion of behaving like an Imagineer. And the behaving like an Imagineer essentially is a kind of proxy for what we might call positive uh, or creative learning behaviours that are manifest in a whole range of, de uh, of, of ac activities that the, the practice develops. And it happens in the context of a, of a community of it, professional Imagineers, artists, designers, engineers, who are familiar in working in partnership, in recognising each other's strengths and, in, and in, in recognising where they need to support each other, where they need to learn new skills and where they can collaboratively um, grow their practice together. And in some ways, it's, it's the inhabiting, it's being part of that world that allows these kind of rich outcomes so that the children are developing knowledge about the sciences, about maths, about technology, about the arts, but they're not, that's not explicit. That's kind of, that is happening through the practice, which itself is feeding their sense of themselves as positive, um, competent and skilled learners. They're seeing each other as being skilled. And as they see each other as skilled, they therefore have the reflection back that they're skilled. And one of the characteristics of the project 
in in terms of the richness of the data not just is it, it d does it demonstrate um you know we we developed a particular measure that's, that's oddly been called the tickle um uh, but the but the, <laughs> this kind of this measure of of creativity that's come out demonstrates that children do develop a more positive sense of themselves as being creative as being comp uh, com uh, competent and that feeds their sense of confidence and it also feeds their sense of knowing the science and technology that the project involves mm -hmm. so as richard says it's a kind of it's an enhancement of it but at the heart of it is a sort of um the individual in effect brings themselves to the table and i guess that's one of the characteristics of the arts is that it encourages that kind of sense of diversity in the personal and if the personal is engaged in a particular way, then children make their own connections to the knowledge that matters to them. Of course, they absorb the core stuff, but there's a deeping that goes on. So these outcomes are, are rich and personal. In fact, another paper that I'm working on with a colleague who researched um, the Imaginarium with me, um, Siobhan, we're looking particularly at, at, at the... You know, she was astounded by something which which is something I'd experienced beforehand but it was lovely having another researcher look at it and she kind of went you know all of these children they've, they've all got their individual stories but they're all stories of growth of confidence and competence as learners and they bring that they're bringing their own agenda but what's happening is it's happening to so many children it can't just be coincidental mm -hmm. so in terms of rich outcomes is that sense of a personally personally grounded rich outcome that maps back to the curriculum Mm -hmm. but is also defined by this kind of almost defining um, collaborative and personal experience that feeds their sense of, of confidence. Did the young people have a greater understanding of creativity, do you think, from conjoining, you know, arts yes. and engineering and Yes, I think so. I mean, it's it's hard to say. In the first the first project, the language of the of the Imagineer wasn't there. You know, there was there was things that you know that were na natural discourses of the of the artists and engineers anyway. So they would talk about you know imagining big and um, you know seeing each other's strengths and working with the possibilities of the materials. And so there'd be language that could you know potentially be seen as being you know positive pedagogy or could be seen as um, a, 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 a particular kind of um, artistic or scientific way of perceiving something. So, you know, you, you could translate it back in that way, but it, in some ways that language came from working from the, uh, the artists and the engineers working with children and, and, you know, getting them to understand what it meant to get inside experimenting from an artistic point of view or experimenting from a scientific point of view, you know, and so they began to understand it in their own terms. And so they would be able to, they would, they could understand that, you know, coming up with a variety of ideas or being able to see something through, you know, these were dimensions of being an effective, you know, being imaginative, thinking big, helping, adding on to an idea. These were all manifestations of being creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I mean, there's a, a lovely example that um, Joe's got about, um, I don't know whether it's ever made it into, into, into press about one of the, the pupils who uh, were told by the, the, the head the following year after they've been involved in Imagineering going in and talking to the head about needing more maths mm. because she began to realise that if she wanted to be an engineer and do that kind of work she needed better maths and maths needed to improve it. So I think one of the interesting things about this is about um, it is about of course pupils understand they understand the limits they understand what it is about their uh, their engagement in and they they're they're, they're, there's immediate feedback to a project in which you're having to apply yourself to do something as opposed to just do sums or something. And th this girl had realised that she she wanted, her maths wasn't quite strong enough in order to do what she wanted to do. So going back to school and saying, well, actually, I want to do it now. So I'm going to go, I, I want my head teacher to go and provide me with, better, with more maths mm -hmm. so I can improve. And I think that's one of the key elements, I think, about this richness that actually brings pupils into their learning journeys and it gives them some responsibility for that and kind of confidence to be able to pursue that further. Now, whether or not that goes on long term or not, I think the issue is from the project's point of view is by creating these kind of opportunities, you end up with pupils actually being transformed as learners. And that's, you know, and one of our complaints at higher education is that, you know, what, what students coming out of the A-level system um, often know how to mark, you know, how to write, you know, 15 uh, mark question answers, but actually, structuring an argument on their own basis around their own ideas or being able to pursue that is is missing yet yeah, this these are the things that i think came out of as well as 
you know, what Joe hasn't mentioned is, is the teacher uh, reporting that actually pupils do improve, you know, in terms of the, the kind of the, the, the learning outcomes are expected against the curriculum, they're achieved. So as well as, you know, so when we're talking about this richness um, and saying, well, of course you can achieve, you can map, you learn all these outcomes, we're saying, well, from the project's point of view, teachers say, yeah, the pupils learned, um, but look at all this other stuff as well that's, that's come through. That, that's, yeah. the, that's the paper that's still in press. That's why I haven't mentioned that one. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think what you're saying, though, Richard, is is where some of my explorations for this project kind of stems from in terms of steam house that, you know, it's it's part of someone's kind of higher education experience, wider experience, too. But, you know, they may be um, in work and want to engage within this amazing space. But what school offering or not offering these young people to actually become those adults to engage in a STEAM way? Mm -hmm. And actually through a lot of the reading about STEAM education and the Borough Commission itself, it's there's also this issue of seeing the arts as potentially separate. And we know with the EBAC, et cetera, that the arts is you know declined in school timetables. So how do we move from just seeing the arts as something separate, but actually an important part of the curriculum and not just seen as something that's a pedagogical device to STEM? <laughs> well, this, the paper we've been doing, we talk about handmaiden. We've actually shifted the, the language in the new paper to servants um, uh, to, 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 to shift that. Um, I, I, I guess I would... Uh, Joe, Joe will have a different perspective to this to some extent because because I, I probably should have said I, I originally trained as a, as a physics teacher so I'm a, I'm, I'm a scientist by background and I think that's one of the things Joe and I play on a lot is actually our own experiences in arts and sciences give us different mm -hmm. positions as educators and teachers in in relation to some of these questions um, uh, I, and I think one of the questions is, between, is whether we're talking about arts and arts, particular arts disciplines and art forms or we're talking about the arts as a kind of overarching kind of um, uh, account which is somehow become separate from science you know don't, well, we're don't talking about the practice of the arts yeah 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 uh, uh, you know the, the, and these, these questions that it, it kind of all, all kinds of problems that emerge in the enlightenment um which should be knocked down and seen as a very bad thing largely uh, in my opinion um i guess where i'm certainly thinking at the moment and this is something i've only just started talking about with joe but i've been digging around in which is um if you take stem as, as and take away the science and the maths uh, and actually say, well, actually, what's what's STEM concerned with educationally, and about the kind of technical and engineering dimensions of uh, uh, careers and, and and career jobs is actually it seems rather odd um, that you would exclude the arts in relation to design and artistic and creative thinking from technology and the engineering because they're so absolutely essential to doing it well. Um, so actually, it seems to me that one of the questions is uh, is to recognise. That actually, that what we want out of even the STEM agenda is essentially artistic as well as scientific. That actually to separate those two apart just seems a stupid idea to start with. So I guess that's that's and certainly, one some, certainly uh, many of the engineers who would consider themselves uh, entrepreneurial innovators would situate themselves in that place. Certainly, the you know, for example, Imagineer, the company who. Um, who I work with in, in terms of developing this research. Um, their, their key people are people who, you know, one who's come out of the film industry in terms of design and become an engineer from that place. And another who, who, who trained as an engineer many years ago when actually drawing was the foundational dimension of your training. That's what your first year began with. And, you know, Richard and I've talked on many occasions the same challenge that uh, um, the Imagineers have talked about, which is the, the, the difference between... Um, you know, a contemporary engineering student who learns uh, how to mathematically model or who learns how to operate with CAD, but actually doesn't actually, uh, you know, work with the materials to understand the possibilities of the materials. So either machinery is designed that's impossible in terms of, you know, what it can, what it can create, or the materials themselves are untested because that knowledge in practice, that, you know, that collaborative work with materials and with each other, is 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 not is not a default thing and that's obviously that is the culture and environment of art making that is the culture of the arts yeah so i think i think when we so i think part, part of what we mean and we, uh, we're not fully tied to the idea of steam ourselves um we are saying you know, in the latest 
we, we talked a little bit more about hybridized curriculum. Harry will talk uh, more about this as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, it's, it's a useful kind of way, but it plays. We, we end up playing with lots of lots of metaphors in order to make sense of it. Uh, but it does seem to me that one of the, the critical questions that I, I think is open at the moment, though Joe may want to close it, um, is to what extent um, uh, the engagement in, if you like, more pure arts forms are a really useful way of helping to develop, if you like, the kind of creative, aesthetic and imaginative dimensions of, um, of, 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 of a human person. And that actually, uh, one of the, there's, there's a number of things going on in the STEAM agenda in relation to the arts. One is, that, is to say that actually to engage practically in the world using science and mathematics through media such as technologies and, and, and engineering um, requires that artistic, imaginative and creative um, uh, dimensions to be as solid as the science and actually both of those need to come together we see that you know explicitly in architecture and other things but you know a, a well-designed machine you know is 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 a thing of beauty uh, as well as a as well as a kind of a, a scientific um uh, product um that's certainly what the engineers on the the imaginarium would say that, that you know that their work has been uh, their their practice has been developed and stimulated as a result of that engagement with the arts and what they want to see is those kind of artistically minded scientists and scientifically minded artists. And that will only happen with this greater sense of, of fluidity. Yeah. Uh, to what, and to what extent you need to be able to, to be, you know, the, 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 a more, uh, a better understanding. Now we are drifting into the next sets of papers because one of the things that came out of the beer review was we, we set out an, a number of papers which we could possibly write in the next 20 years. Um, <laughs> but one of these questions about the, the kind of the way in which we are able to communicate with our bodies effectively and are taught to be able to do that and the way we improve our drawing. So working with the, the, the teachers on Teach Make, we did a session with them, um, an online session uh, a couple of months ago where spent most of a morning just developing their drawing skills. You know, how do you communicate through drawing to pupils and how can pupils you know, uh, learn through the process of drawing as opposed to writing or doing a math sum? You know, how, how do they communicate through their bodies and understand and, through their engagement with their bodies? And, and thinking about the work that we did last week as well, that, that line between movement as a, as a means of express, expression and the, and the idea of, of, of movement and the body uh, and drawing as being legitimate languages with which we communicate and understand and know and expanding the kind of palette that, that, that you know that, that children can work with as there is you know and, and that requires teachers being enabled to think that actually uh, facilitating uh, visual and movement and aural based uh, communication is as significant as written you know why is the default always the word in terms of you know assessment in terms of knowing in terms of recording uh, and we can only you know move that forward by promoting so you know in in, in effect you know ad advancing the the significance of the body because the body has been you know removed so significantly from the educative process and i think that comes back to the other issue really uh, for, for me in in relation to the the imaginarium which goes back to your you know your 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 question about um uh, you know about the arts and the pedagogy and how we position it which is you know i, I guess the the imaginarium to my mind or certainly in the way i've conceived of it um suggests that actually if the if art making becomes the site for education then what what, what you're, you're generating is is um the the notion of doing and making as core educative processes and that within that art making process, there may at times be technical, scientific, mathematical, historical, you know, linguistic developments that are focused on particular forms of, of knowledge, particular um, uh, skills as well. But that 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 art making becomes kind of the crucible, the context, the practice, and uh, young people then become uh, like like artists, you know, like imagineers. They they are the makers. They are collectively working and they look to each other and you're developing this much more kind of horizontal sense of expertise, much more of a community of experts. And, and in some ways that feels much more real and it reflects what happens in the real world and perhaps allies more with your kind of, you know, the, the sort of startup framework you're trying to generate uh, mm -hmm. at, at Birmingham. And mm -hmm. so in, 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 in some ways it feels to me that this notion of, you know, 
it, where do you get more art in? Or how, you know, it, it's not about looking at the deficit. It's looking at what's the best climate and context and practice for learning. And to my mind, you can argue that art making can provide that site. Uh, yeah, I, I think one needs to, I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, is I'd like to see is, is uh, when we when we recognize, you know, something like dance your PhD mm. is not just a representative of your PhD, but the, but really focus on the number of PhD uh, students who are understanding their doctoral work through the medium of dance. And actually saying, actually, you know, for many, you know, Nietzsche used to write and stuff, but then he'd go for a very long walk to think it through. And those long walks weren't, I mean, you know, weren't just about walking. They were about the kind of physicality of, of, of movement. And, you know, Dewey uses all these kind of expressions for the natural environment, you know. Um, so I think um, we, we need to kind of rethink as well what it is we're focusing on about what it is that we do as thinkers. And, I, and our PhD students do as thinkers in order to be able to, I think, start to engage with the richness of the ways in which we represent ideas initially and start to gather those. And we, you know, talked way back about, you know, one of the things about STEM is we kind of struggle with what metaphors we're going to use. But it seems to me that one is we are using metaphors. We, you know, Joe and I, we use drawing. You know, when we were allowed to be together, um, you know, we'd sit down and we'd draw and sketch out ideas, you know, and, um, you know, we'd see we see people all the time, particularly the artists we work with, no surprising, use gesture and movement to be able to express ideas. And it seems to me that one of the, the, the thing that the elements about STEAM is it opens up, not just the idea that somehow the arts are embedded in STEM, because in a sense, that's not a, that shouldn't be a difficult argument to make. Um, uh, it's odd that we need to make it in some senses. Mm -hmm. um, what it does do is it opens up and, and makes us recognise that actually that the focus on a kind of technocratic um, a reductionist approach to the curriculum and pedagogy is deeply problematic. That a kind of a mis a kind of a seventeenth century, eighteenth century view, perhaps of the of, of the of the sciences, has has maintained its hold on education far longer than it's held it on the sciences. You know that, and and so we we need, in a sense, I think, through this kind of broadening of the, of this kind of the, the science systems we use in education, kind of uh, dividing those kind of rich experiences. Um, that enable pupils not only to learn particular outcomes, but actually to grow as learners and as self-educators. I mean, finding those kind of things in its STEM allows us the possibility, I think, to be able to, because it's new, because it requires us to innovate, um, allows us to be able to explore some of those ideas in, in more detail, both Imagineering now in Teach Make. Um, don't know what else we can get some money for to, to be able to, to do work on the future. <laughs> um, but that's that's the that's the, that's the kind of plan. And I think I think it's a, a really so I think for me, Steve, um, because of the multiple purposes and actually now being able to pull back towards the curriculum level gives us the opportunity to really think through innovation from the from the ground up with some good data about how pupils learn best as opposed to how we've done things before. Um, and I think some of that kind of is, is clash, clashes, um, and that's why it's seen as being novel and original. But nevertheless, it does seem to me that actually we've got the evidence that this is a really positive uh, way of doing education. Um, the critical question is how then do we make and enable schools to be able to embed this in as, on, as part of their day-to-day -day practice as opposed to the Imagineerium as a, as a kind of project. And that, I guess, is where Joe and I are working now, which is you know, what what are the compromises you need to make and how do you need to work with teachers in order to be able to for them to think in these these kind of broader ways um, and be much more self-critical, essentially, of, of how they form their identity in the first place as teachers. Mm -hmm. So they can do that well. And now we're saying we'll give up on all that because I know give up on a lot of that because that's who we, we, we think we need to move to a different place is I think the you know, is the is the task now. Um, and I, and I find it odd to some extent that we're still arguing whether we, we argue that um, the art shouldn't be embedded in that. That just seemed to be another kind of classic um, misunderstanding of what education is about and what education uh, should be achieving. Well, I think that's a, a lovely way to finish this conversation. Thank you so much. You've given me so much food for thought and I'm sure anybody who watches this will have a lot to think about. I think I'm going to think a little bit more deeply about learning about ways of becoming and being a learner within the classroom but also you've posed some really interesting questions about teachers themselves and what you're working on at the moment in terms of teacher development and how 
you get teachers to understand the importance of all the subjects and how they combine, how they're complementary, and what outcomes actually look like in the classroom. It's some really is, some is it's, that same, it's that same confidence for teachers, though, that the children need. You know, teachers have not been conceived as the crafters of the curriculum. They have not been conceived as ones who can actually draw upon their own instinctive sense of specialisms. And I think that's the exciting bit about this project is actually bringing them to the table. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to finding out more about it's teach, 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 teach make. Teach Make, fantastic. So we look forward to seeing what happens with Teach Make. And thank you so much. Um, yeah, that has been really fascinating. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you very much, Victoria. Yeah.